We ask you, Lord Jesus, look upon, Lord Jesus, the apostles everywhere, Lord. Look upon the prophets, Lord, the missionaries, Lord Jesus, pastors, Lord, in the name of Jesus, like God of hosts, Lord Jesus. We ask you, Lord, take charge, Lord, and have your way, Lord. Let your will be done, Lord Jesus. Not mine, not there, Lord, but your will be done, Lord. Call it to your will, your way. Your grace and your mercy, Lord, in the name of Jesus, our God of hosts, Lord. We ask you, Lord Jesus, look upon Lord Jesus, bereaved families everywhere, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord Jesus, look upon Lord Jesus, those, Lord, that caught up in floods, Lord, in the name of Jesus, earthquakes, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord Jesus, long and eruption, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord Jesus, we ask you, Lord, look upon your peoples everywhere, Lord, Lord God of hosts, Lord. We ask you, Lord, look upon the sick and the shunning everywhere, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord. Those that are confined to their homes, Lord, hospitals, nursing homes, and convalescing home, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord. We ask you, Lord Jesus, look upon the family members, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord God of hosts, Lord, we ask you, Lord Jesus, rain down your latter rain, Lord, rain down your latter rain, Lord, upon your people, Lord, in the name of Jesus, rain down your Holy Ghost, Lord, rain down your Holy Ghost, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord, rain down your latter rain and your Holy Ghost, Lord, upon this sanctuary, Lord Jesus, upon each member, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord Jesus, we ask you, Lord Jesus, increase, Lord, in a mighty way, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the good and the bad, Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the ups and downs, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord, look upon the harm and the starving everywhere, Lord, Lord, look upon Lord Jesus, the hopeless everywhere, Lord, Lord God of hosts, Lord. Look upon Lord Jesus, the young and the old everywhere, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we ask you, Lord. Look upon the wine, biblical, alcoholics, and drug addicts, Lord, prostitutes, pimps, Lord, homosexuals, male and female, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord Jesus. Look upon Lord Jesus, those that are in the juvenile hall, Lord Jesus, behind prison bars, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to touch our mind, hearts, and souls, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord. We come to praise your name, Lord. We come to glorify you, Lord. We come to hold up the bloodstained banner, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord. We ask you, Lord, our Lord, to speak in the teacher today, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God of hosts, Lord. We ask you, Lord, take charge of the servants today, Lord, and have your way, Lord. Let your will be done, not mine, not theirs, Lord, but your will be done according to your will, your way, your grace, and your mercy, Lord Jesus. These blessings and others, we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us worship the Lord all together here today. Let us worship the Lord in His presence as we pray. Till we dare to receive you and His presence, you is joy. Be at peace with the Lord. Yeah. 
But you know what? We're in God's house. And where there's peace and joy yes, and Lord. love, and we can enjoy it. Hallelujah. If we can't stand and yes, sing Lord. that one yes, more Lord. time, come let us yes, worship the Lord. Lord. Okay, don't forget to, to read them and pray over these people. 
Okay, Bob, who was in the hospital, um, he needs prayer. Darlene hasn't been up to snuff either. Pray for her also, please. Uh, Ray, because we're waiting words on his surgery. Cleo, Evangelist Cleo, his back has been giving him some trouble. He hasn't been able to come to church for a couple weeks. Uh, Barb and Darlene's family, their daughter Tammy and husband Jim both have cancer. Their son and wife, his wife, are both having respiratory problems. And another son is having prostrate. So all of Bob and Darlene's, oh, and another one needs to quit smoking. So all of Bob and Darlene's family is really struggling. So please keep them covered in prayer. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all of Israel. The orphanage in Pakistan, these children need funds to, to eat, okay? Um, they eat, I think it's one meal every other day. Maybe it's a meal a day, I forget which, but either way, would you uh, would you like to have just one meal a day? I would. I, I, you know, I like to have three, like most people. We'd like to make sure that they at least get that one. And pray for the church finances and pastor's real estate business. Amen. And pray for our pastor, amen? Amen. <laughs> and everybody have a blessed week and come out for our activities this week. Thank you, Pastor Deb. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? All the time, He is good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, look, Tony and Scott, good to have you both here today. Amen. Praise God. Holla, Barbara, good to have you back, Graham. Good to have you back. Amen. Praise the Lord. Cassandra, good to have you back with us today. Praise God. Okay, so next week, now, look around and see all these empty seats. Yeah. We really need to fill them next week. Yes, we, we have a world-class, I'm not even kidding you, gospel band coming. They have played for President George Bush, 43. And uh, they regularly they go and they play for a uh, group in Texas where he's at. And they have played with the Gaithers. And they're all over the place. They're a Southern gospel group. They're going to pull up in a big old yellow bus, they tell me, where they, they sleep and tour on. And uh, they, I, I don't want to be embarrassed. You know, I think that we should, we should honor them and tell people about it and invite them to come out so that when they can come, because they play in like packed stadiums, I think we should be able to fit 100 people in the church to come out and see them. Amen? Amen. So that's what I mean by saying I don't want to be embarrassed because I think we should do a good job of getting the word out and having people come out to see them and hear them. We're going to, we're going to let you see one of their videos today. So it's called it's called uh, Bible Story. Amen. So let's watch. This is uh, Mark 209.
given you the courage, he's given you the strength. Put your faith in God, and I promise if you do, he will make a Bible story. Amen. And to some of the Trinity people we knew, and they can go to the early service at their church and then come on over here. Amen. Amen. Because uh, we want to have a nice full house. We go visit other people's churches all the time. They can come visit ours. So let's uh, let's go and uh, invite them and tell them to come on over and to be part of what God is doing. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God. Hallelujah. The dead tell you Happy New Year. Rosh Hashanah. Happy Feast of Trumpets, everybody. Uh, Dad, did you read what, that email that came from uh, from Olga? I, I, I want to explain to you something that uh, that uh, about Feast of Trumpets. What we are celebrating when we celebrate the Feast of Trumpets, okay? Uh, listen to this. Okay, the, the coming this coming up Wednesday, we're going to celebrate it on the actual day, Thursday, okay? But it starts Wednesday evening. September 20th uh, starts the seventh month of Tish, Tishri in the Bible's calendar. Come celebrate at 7 p.m. It's the seventh month in the Bible calendar, but it's the first month of the, of the, the new year, okay? There's two new years in Judaism in Israel, so... The Feast of Trumpets is a season of repentance. There's a day of judgment. It's the coronation of King Jesus. It's the opening of the gate, and it's the wedding of Messiah. Those day things are all going to happen on Feast of Trumpets, or they have happened. So uh, it's coronation day. It's judgment day. It's Messiah's wedding. That would be our wedding too, amen? Because we're the bride of Messiah, are we not? Amen? So we are celebrating by faith the promises of God. So we are, he promised to send Messiah to get us, right? Well, the Feast of Trumpets celebrates our wedding, and proclaiming those things that are not as if they are. When we go to heaven, what are we going to do? We're going to have the marriage supper of what? The Lamb. That's where the bride, hello, without spot or wrinkle, amen? So these feasts of the Lord that we're learning about they're so important because they not only talk about what God promised to do, what God has already done, but what he's planning to do in our futures. Amen? Yeah. But remember, he is the great, what is he? I yeah. am, right? So what he is, he is always. Amen? Yeah. He's a God of yesterday, today, and forever. And that's why when we celebrate the feast, we celebrate things in the past, in the present, and in the future. It's a celebration of God and his relationship of, with mankind throughout all of eternity. Do you get it? Do you get it? It's not this Jewish stuff. It's God stuff. You know, that you know that when people, you need to start correcting people when they say, oh, your church is all that Jewish stuff. No, it's God's stuff. It's what he intended for the church all along. And it was stolen from us by the Roman emperor who brought all the pagan garbage into the church. So let's get away from the pagan stuff now that God has showed us by the Holy Spirit what was pagan. And let's get on with worshiping God the way he told us to worship him. Amen? Amen. Is God's word true? Amen. All 66 books, are they all true? Or do you just take part of them? So that's why I want you to come out on Wednesday at 1 o'clock. We've been missing some of you that, that aren't able to come, that haven't been able to come. We are, I'm praying God's going to want you to make you want to come because we're studying what God is doing now in this hour. We can't study like this on Sundays, okay? But what God is doing now in this hour for his bride, it, we're studying it in depth on Wednesdays. 
And so if you haven't been coming out on Wednesdays, if you got out of the habit and you just like your afternoon off, it, ask the Lord. And I'm not getting on anybody. If you can't come, you can't come. But if you can, and you have a desire to learn about the things God is doing, what he's saying to the church now, what does it say in Revelation? Though, let's say it together. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen? Those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We were born for such a time as this, and God is speaking this word to the church. He's saying, come out from the pagan idolatry and step into the true, pure, holy worship of the Most High God. Not in bondage. We're not going back into bondage. We're stepping into the way God always desired his people to worship him, but we were blinded. Amen? Just like many of the Jewish people were blinded to the Messiah, God did that so they would preserve the feast that we perverted and got rid of. Hallelujah. But now, Ephesians chapter 2 says that Christ has torn down the middle wall of separation that once was enmity, made enmity between the Jew and the Gentile. And out of the twain, out of the two, he has made one new man. Okay? He's made one new man out of the two. Amen? So if he's made one new man out of the Jew Gentile, we are to worship him in spirit and in what? Truth. truth. Say truth. 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 The truth was stolen from the body of Christ, but the Holy Spirit has given it back to us, so we need to worship him in truth. We cannot keep doing the same old things they did 50, 60 years ago when they were in darkness. But since the Spirit is now speaking to the church, we must do what the Spirit is speaking. And the Spirit is speaking this truth to the entire body of Christ. Amen. You're going to see larger ministries coming out of this coming out of the pagan idolatry, coming out of all the garbage, coming out of the witchcraft. You know that, that, that manipulation of any kind is witchcraft, amen? So we want to come out from the legalistic manipulation and the religious spirits of the past, amen? Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. We want to come out of, you know what, I was, a few weeks ago I was discouraged about something. And I said, maybe I ought to just, I was trying to be transparent, and I was trying to be honest with everything. I like. I think we're supposed to be honest, amen? amen. And, 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 and I was getting some flack for some things, of, some misunderstanding. And I made a statement, I said, maybe I should just go back into my own religious spirit. Because people are happier if I just walk around like a, a righteous Pharisee and I keep everything hidden that I don't think people will all like. Alright, alright now. Alright now. Alright. Right. Right. And a very wise young person encouraged me. I don't know if she knows how much she encouraged me. And she said, don't go back into religion. No. Don't go back. No. Been there, done that. And that simple thing encouraged me enough to keep me going, amen? amen. I was ready. I was ready to walk away for a season, but that one word kept me going. How I many of you know that sometimes you give a word when you're inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it can keep you going, amen? amen. It can keep you moving forward, and uh, and and so we must admonish one another to walk in the truth. Can, can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So. Let's be spirit-led. Say spirit-led. Spirit let's hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. And let's come out to Bible study. And if you don't come out, get the book for yourself and study it. Because 
you know, we have all of the feasts of the Lord by divine appointment. Dr. Maureen Jacks, who I, we know and trust, we know she is filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, with the Spirit, the Holy of the Holy One. Amen? That's the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. That's how it's referred to in the Bible, in the original language. The Spirit of the Holy One, the Holy Spirit. Okay? Noreen Jacks, Dr. Noreen Jacks is our personal friend and she's filled with the Holy Spirit. She has a doctorate in theology and she's done a beautiful job at searching out the Feast of the Lord and what they mean to us as Christians. Amen? Amen. And how we can walk in unity with our Jewish sisters and brothers and we can all worship God in spirit and in truth. God gave her this beautiful thing and I want to tell you something. It was inspired because of our ministry at this church with her. And for the ladies' conferences that she's done and the Purim conference, in fact, there's a picture of our church in the book. And uh, every time she's come to our church, God's given her something more about the feast until she finally wrote the book about all of the feasts. And she said, Pastor, thank you. This is, And I had encouraged her to do workbook styles. And so for our syllabus, as she started doing workbook styles, and God used us to get her to publish the book. Amen? So isn't it, you never know what God's going to do. So now that God used us to inspire her to publish a book about what His Holy Spirit is saying to the church, don't you think that maybe that we should study that book ourselves? Amen? Amen. And get to know it? Amen? So, so let's come out on Wednesdays at 1 if we're not working. And if you don't feel led to come out at 1, why don't you get a copy of the book and read it at home and study it as the Holy Spirit tells you to and call me with questions. Because not everybody can go come to a Bible study at 1 o'clock. Some people work. Some people don't have the energy. And there is no condemnation in that. Amen? Not at all. But I want you to know what the Spirit is saying to the church. So you don't feel lost when you come in. And you'll be on the cutting edge. You'll find out. Uh, the, some larger ministries are starting to, to wake up to this fact. And when they start waking up, they're going to get really excited to say, Hey, our, our church has been doing this for a few years now. Because this is what God is going to do in the body of Christ. And now the sad thing is, a lot of the church is going to go the wrong way. A lot of the church is going to go into apostasy. There was a meeting in Jerusalem um, just last week of, of leaders from various main denominations and other religions, other faiths. Okay, so like Buddhists, the Baha'i faith, and, and all of these other teaching Eastern religions. And the Pope, and the Pope led it. And what they're doing is they're trying to form a world religion that everybody can merge into. And we have main denominations that we've always thought of as Christian churches being involved in this movement. Well, if you read in, if you read in the book of Revelation of what this movement is going to be called, it's called the Whore of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And the false prophet of the man of perdition, which we know is the Antichrist, the Antichrist is going to have his own religion. He's going to have his own religious leader called the false prophet until he devours him. Or the other, the kings of the earth will. And then, But for a while, when he sets up his, his kingdom <coughs> that's against God, the man of perdition is going to have his own religion that most of the world is going to follow. And it's going to look, and, and, and a lot of, a lot of the, the people that haven't woke up to Messiah, they're going to even think he's the Messiah. They won't know until he puts his image of himself. I'll just tell you to go to Amos chapter 9. And it talks about the rebuilding of David's house, or David's sukkah. Amen? And so, and, so, and then it ends, that chapter 9 ends, it says, that he will restore them to their land. They'll, they'll plant wine vineyards. He didn't say grape juice. Anyway, just saying. Get rid of that religious spirit. And I'm not an advocate for alcohol, but I'm saying get rid of that religious spirit. Read the Word of God. 
And it says he'll plant vineyards and they'll drink wine in the city and the in Jerusalem. And then it says, they will never, say never, never. be plucked out again. Never. 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 So we don't have to worry about Israel being destroyed because they will never be plucked out again. But we do have to be worried about the direction that a lot of the churches have. Say half. There were ten virgins, right? In the parable of the virgins, there were ten, right? I'm just planting seeds. I'm going to say this a few times until it just takes root because the Holy Spirit's going to make them wake up in all of you. Okay? There were ten virgins. They were all part of the current church at one point. So you can throw out your once saved, always saved doctrine. Or else you can say they were five of them were never really saved. But ten of them were virgins. So that looks like um, they were all part of the church. All right. They all fell asleep, which is where the church has been for the last 20 years at least, but probably for the last hundred. They all fell asleep to the truth. We, we quit celebrating the feast. Remember, the early Christians, they were almost all Jews. And then, uh, then with the house of Cornelius, the Gentiles started coming in, and Paul and Peter started ministering to the Gentiles, okay? But they were all Jews, and they were supposed to keep the feast. And all the early church, including our Messiah, Jesus, the Savior of the world, he kept all the feasts. All right. So you want to be like Jesus? Then be like the, those in the house of David and honor the feasts of the Lord. They were stolen from the church and we were sold a bunch of garbage that has nothing to do with serving God. Well. But half of the church is lost. Half. At least half. Because well. five of the virgins don't have oil. But the oil, oil represents the Holy Spirit. Not the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Salvation. Amen. So half no longer have salvation. It says they're put into outer darkness. Outer darkness. It's not like they just tell you the kids come in later. Outer darkness is the second death every time it's mentioned. So, if you have a different interpretation of that, that's fine. All I gotta tell you is, I don't want to be those other five virgins. I want to be the first five, amen. I want to be the ones that made it in, that had the oil, made it in, that had the oil of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus said in Revelation chapter two, this has been taught wrong over and over. I want to tell you, Revelation chapter two, Jesus says he has one thing against the church of Ephesus. They have. He saw their endurance. He saw their good deeds. He saw their good works. A lot of this. But he had one thing against them that he said to return to your first love. But, but, but that's what we've been taught, Pastor Johnny. And, and this is what the Lord was showing me. In a way, it's right, though. Is that we've always been taught, oh, he means we forgot about Jesus, return to him. But, but right there in verse three, right the verse before, Pastor, it didn't, he said, I know you have persevered for my name's sake. Amen. So they didn't forget Jesus. They were persevering for Jesus. All right. That's not what he was talking about. Jesus is the living Torah, the living word. You heard him say the living word, right? Amen. Yes. I, I'm going to tell you this over and over until, you, until it comes on. <clears throat> He's the living Torah. He's the living word. Most of the church were all Jewish before they ever met Jesus. They loved God. Right. How did they come to God? Through the word of God. Now they come to the Son who's the word, right? So if he says, return to your first love, what was their first love? The word, the word of God. So Jesus says to, he says, to repent. So you see, those that don't keep Torah... They're living in sin. I'm not talking about being legalistic. We should have a desire to please God, even though we know we can't do it. We're not saved. No man is saved by our works or by doing anything, keeping any feast. None of that saves us. But that's what we should do in obedience to God, to worship Him the way He wants to be worshipped. It's just like the reason we live righteously. You can fall in sin... But you, because you're not perfect and still have your salvation, 
But you have to repent. Amen? Yes. You have to repent to be restored. And so that's what he's saying to the church. Repent. You quit keeping my feast. You kept living holy. And we got all these churches now telling people, live however you want to live, and you're still going to go to heaven. It's not true. <clears throat> we need to keep the word of God. Because even though we're not saved by our works, Faith, we're saved by faith in the Lamb of God, right? In the Messiah. Faith in Messiah. That's why we're saved. But faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. So we can't be saved if our faith is dead. So we got to have that balance that only the Spirit of God can give us. You say, Spirit of God. Not Pastor Tim. Not me. Don't look at me, man. I am really flawed, okay? But I will teach you what is true. And I will attempt to walk what is true myself. Okay? But don't look at Pastor Tim. I'm going to try to be a good example. But you're going to find, if you look too close, you're going to find something you don't like. I promise. I promise. I try to be a good example. I try to be a godly man. I walk under the anointing of the power of God. But you want to look at Jesus. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And you want to verify everything in the Word. Amen? No, say the whole Word. The whole Word. Not just the New Testament, the whole Word. Amen? Alright, I just wanted to reiterate that again. I wanted to plant some seeds, but tie those together. When you go into Matthew chapter 7, he's going to go there for me because I want to show you this. Matthew chapter 7, and go down to verse 22. Now, this is where the church and its pastors, I don't want to be this person. I don't want to be with any of these people, okay? But we're going to have many that are in this. Many, say many, many, will say to me, this is Jesus talking. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name did many wonderful works? Why? Because God gives you gifts of the Spirit to do those things. When you fall into sin, you don't lose your gifts. He's not a taker backer of the gifts. You can still operate in all those gifts he gave you. But if you're not keeping Torah, not trying to please him, he's going to say, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. But if you go back to the Greek, it says you that work lawlessness, and if you translate it from the Greek back into the, his native tongue, to the Hebrew or to the Aramaic, it reads, depart from me, you without Torah. We need Torah. We, we need Torah. Amen? That's why we're learning more and more about the Feast of the Lord. Amen. I didn't need to take all the time. We have a big program today. But I, I, I think it's important that you understand that we're not just a weirdo little church that's trying to do all Jewishy things because we think it's cool. Where it makes us feel good to wear a tallit and do Jewish dances and all of that, you know. That's not, that's, and it's not just some frivolous thing. Oh yeah, we worship with the Jewish style over there. It's not a style. It's what the Holy Spirit is saying to the true body of Christ. And he's calling us out of pagan worship. We got away with it because of the grace of the cross. And there are many people that went to heaven that didn't know the truth. But now he's revealing the truth to us for a reason. So we should fall, walk in that truth. Amen? Amen? We should walk in that. We should know it. My father was in 1972 or 1973. I remember the first time I ever saw Christ in his Passover. And it wasn't done by Jews for Jesus. It was done by Pastor Ted Hinkle, my dad. 
And that was a new thought back then in the church. And for years and years and years, he led the way in trumpeting the call to look at the feast and find Jesus in them. And that's what we did. He was a forerunner. But if someone runs before and prepares the way, somebody cuts out a path. You're supposed to walk down it. Does that make sense? If God sends a forerunner to cut down a path, He expects you to walk on that path. He cut down. So put that in your spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit if it's true and if it bears witness. I know it will. And let's stand it together and worship the Lord. Let's have our worship team come.
worship as you have a need today. We never want you to come to the house of God without an opportunity to be prayed for, to pray with the leadership. The word of God tells us that if any of, our, any of you are sick, to let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil. And if he's committed any sins, he shall be forgiven. And he shall be healed. So in obedience to the Lord, we would like to pray for you today. If you're sick, if you have a physical sickness or someone in your family needs a healing, we want to stand with you for that healing. If you have an emotional problem or another need in your life, we want to agree with Lord that the promises of God are yes and amen in Yeshua Messiah. Amen. The promises of God are yes and amen in Yeshua Messiah. Praise in Jesus the Christ. Hallelujah. So at this time, our prayer team, please come. And they'll agree with you now. As you come, and let him hear your needs. And agree together that he's already met them.
shofar get it out as we were finishing up the prayer for everybody the Lord prompted for me to he said just like Gideon I'm going to give you the victory just like Gideon judges and I got excited I got excited when I read this because God's timing is impeccable it's Rosh Hashanah week, amen? It's the feast of what? Trumpets this week, amen? Listen to this. So the 300... Ah, oh, Rebecca. 7-7. Seven, seven. Then Adonai said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lacked, I will deliver you and give the Midianites into your hand. So let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the 300 took provisions and the shofar wrote their trumpets in their hands. He sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tent, but he kept the 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. It came to pass that same night that Adonai said to him, Arise, get down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, first go down to the camp with your attendant to oh, Then you will hear what they are saying. And after that, your hands will be strengthened to attack the camp. So he went down with his attendant to Rah to an outpost of the army that was in the camp. Now the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their camels were countless as numerous as the sands of the seashore. Yet when Gideon came, behold, there was a man relating a dream to his fellow, saying, Listen, I just now had a dream. There was a loaf of barley bread that came in, trembling into the camp of Midian, came up to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned upside down, so that the tent lay flat. His companion answered and said, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, son of Johash, the men of Israel, God has delivered Gideon and all the camp into his hand. Now when Gideon heard of the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. Then he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for Adonai has given into your hand the camp of Midian. Then he divided the 300 men into the three columns and put into the hands of all of them shofarot and empty pitchers with torches inside the pitchers. Then he said to them, Watch me and do likewise. So behold, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do just as I do. When I and all that are within me blow the shofar, then you also blow the shofar all around the camp and say, For Adonai and for Gideon. So Gideon and the 300 men who were with him caught up the outermost, the outermost part of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch when they had just posted the watch. Then they blew the shofarot and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. When the three columns blew the shofarot and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in the left hands and the shofarot in the right hands and to blow. And they shouted, a sword for Adonai and for Gideon. Each one stood in his place around the camp. And when the end, the entire army ran, shouting as they fled. Now when they blew the 300 shofarot, Adonai said, every man's sword against his fellow throughout the entire army, so that the army fled as far as Beth Shittah toward Zerah, for as the border of Abel and Mahola by Tabath, the men of Israel were summoned from Naphtali, Asher, and all of Manasseh, and they pursued Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against Midian and seize the waters down to Beth Barah, all along the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were summoned and took control of the waterside as far as Beth Barah by the Jordan. Then they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeab. They slew Oreb at the rock of the Oreb, and they slew Zeab at the winepress of Zeab. They kept pursuing Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeab to Gideon from across the Jordan. You see, not only did they destroy their attackers, 
by listening to what God told them to do. They pursued them until they took off the head of the enemy. You're not only to have victory in your life, but you're to chase that enemy out of the camp and cut its head off. Valiantly, victoriously by the Lord. Amen? Amen. That's for somebody today. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hallelujah. <sighs> the sound of the trumpet. Hallelujah. Let's call the little children forward and then we'll release them to uh, children's church, are we? Uh, after the, uh, not yet, but we're going to release them after the, uh, the offering of the Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Just pause for a moment. Let what the Holy Spirit said sink in. <coughs> you see, God had to whittle down the thousands to just 300 so he could be glorified. Although I would rather this be a mega church, we're not going to despise the hand of the Lord right here. Because little is much when God is in it. So if he could slay thousands with 300 men, he can use us to accomplish his will in this community. I still believe we're supposed to grow, we're supposed to be a witness, we're supposed to be a light, we're supposed to go into all the men. I'm not going to use that as an excuse for laziness. We still have to be workers. But if we do all we can do to stand, then we stand for, therefore, and we allow God to do what He wants to do. Amen? So we need to do our part. We need to reach out and bring people in. Amen? You know what? Sometimes you have to give of yourself to bring people in. Does that make any sense? It's not always easy. Sometimes you got to do something to get people in the door. And your motive shouldn't be to get people in the door. That's just the result. Your motive should be to love other people with the love of God. Amen? Amen. But if you're loving other people with the love of God, it will bring them into fellowship because they'll want what you have. Amen? You know, we could say that that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it is true. Because sometimes we think, oh, I can't give. I can't even give 10% because I, I just have all these things that I want to do. But you know, not only does the tithe belong to God, but so does everything you possess. God owns it all. As we, as we are just entrusted with it for a brief period of time while we're here. You know, because when we're gone, all of the material things just becomes nothing. Amen. Nothing. Amen. And you know, sometimes we think we just can't give. But you know, you just have to reach down and have some faith. The faith is what changes all things. Amen. I know sometimes we're afraid to write that check or we're afraid to use our ATM card or we're afraid to do this or we're afraid to do that. You know, sometimes people are just afraid to step out their front door. But we need to know that God honors everything that we do. And faith believing God is there. God knows it all. He sees it all. He has it all. And he will do all things through us. Let's stand this morning. Father... We know that you are in control of all things. And we know that you can do all things. We know that everything that we give is going to multiply. Father.
Father, even if it may be three, then you can multiply to six or nine or 18. Father, you just multiply it. You keep doubling it over and over and over again because we know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, but we have to give that little something before you can multiply it. That has to be given before you can do anything with it. So, Father, I just ask that everyone in this room would give something so that you can do something with it. Father, so that you can multiply not just our finances, but you can multiply in, in protecting us in our healing. Father, we just ask that you would just do all things with everything that we have. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' almighty name, amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, we have talked about Almighty God. 
and all the miracles God has done. Uh, we're going to ask Mary Lou to come at this time and to share what God has done. Uh, we're going to skip over the partial right now. Amen. Because we, we took so long here. And uh, we're going to have you come and to share what God has done. Sister Mary Lou spoke yesterday at the uh, the fellowship breakfast. And you, if you're not making it out to that, you should come. We have a great time in Mount uh, Brookfield the third the third week, and uh, you should come on out and enjoy it. Uh, God, she was going through all of the miracles God has done in her family's life since she came to know the Lord. And so let's give. We said let's have her talk about this at church. So let's uh, give Mary Lou and God a great day to welcome. Trust people. They're not going to be there for you. Right. 
The people that ran the orphanage was trying to get money from my father to pay for our keep. But naturally, my dad was a drinking dad. He would work and spend his money on his alcohol. And so he didn't want to pay anything. So they finally caught up with him, and he had to come and get us. And that was the beginning of a nightmare. But we'll just leave that and go over to where I'll pick it up about getting saved. I heard from my aunts and uncles that my mother was a praying mom. So those prayers were already at work with God. Because God had a lady over here at the school that was a Christian woman by the name of Dee Morrell. And she kept asking me to go to church with her. I kept making up excuses till I couldn't think of any more lies to tell her. So I finally told her that I would go with her just to get her off my back. Now, when I was in the Catholic orphanage, we were taught by the nuns that we should respect anybody that had gray hair, and this lady had gray hair. So, I really respected her even though I didn't want to go to church with her. All right, all right. But she went to this Nazarene church in North Sacramento, and she never gave up on me though. She kept asking me to go to church with her. And um, so when I did go to the church, you talk about sneaky, she had everybody in there waiting for me to come and praying. So, when I walked through them doors, the power of God was so strong, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything about God or the power of God or nothing, but I knew that I never felt like that before. And so one minute I was sitting in my seat, and the next minute I was running down the aisle because I was so hungry for something. I needed something, and it was God. But you have to realize that I didn't have a mom, and I didn't have this, and I didn't have that. No aunts, no uncles, none of that stuff. And I just was, I guess I was mad at God. I didn't believe him, but I guess if he was there, I was still mad at him because I thought life was very unfair. Other people, I watched them and I seen the kids climb up on the laps of their parents and their hugs and kisses they got and I didn't get none of that. So, and that was 51 years ago. Me getting saved was the first miracle. Miracle number two happened like this. Shortly after I turned my life over to Jesus, I found out that my 15 year old daughter was expecting. Was I in shock? She was supposed to be babysitting just kids. I didn't let her date. She was too young. But she wasn't babysitting children. She was babysitting a boyfriend. So, I, you know, I wasn't a smart mother then. I didn't, didn't know how to check up on your kids and um, make sure they're where they say they're supposed to be and all that good stuff. So, anyway, one night we were taking the family to a Christian function. And I had been praying and praying for Gloria to get saved, but to no avail. We were all at the Governor's Hall. Anybody remember the Governor's Hall downtown? Okay. And um, Gloria was up in the bleachers singing in the choir, the Nazarene choir. She was up there. And I was down on the floor in the auditorium. And when they gave the altar call, I was so tired and discouraged that I just hung my head and I told the Lord, I'm done. I am done. I'm done. I'm not praying for that girl no more. But as I stood there with my head down, my friend Jan, who stood next to me, touched my arm and said, Sis, look at Gloria. At first I didn't look up, and when I did, I was a total shock. Gloria was coming down from way up in the bleachers, stepping on people, stepping on their heads and their laps, all over them, coming down. She was coming to the altar. Hallelujah. And I just stood there and cried like a baby. So see, when you take your hands off of things, then Jesus can come in and do the work. Amen. And she got saved that night. And she's been serving God ever since. And you all remember, she comes here and sings lots of times. Okay, uh, that was um, in 1966. And in 1968, 
This is miracle number three. Jan and I went to church faithfully with our eight children. Can you imagine coming to the church with eight kids? But then we were young in the Lord and we didn't know how to deal with some things in the church, so we got our feelings hurt. And that's what the enemy uses because the church is full of people, just people. I mean, and we're not saints, we're just trying to be saints. And we're still just people with different kinds of attitudes. And the main thing is don't, don't wear your feelings on your sleeve. Come to church for God, not for people. And, and don't take offense. Okay. Um, so we got our feelings hurt and put going. By this time, my daughter had a little boy by the name of Ronnie. He's my son's namesake. By now I had met a man that had loved me and was very good to my five kids, so we got married. And one day I was watching my grandson, Ronnie, at my house when I noticed him behind the door in the bedroom and he was choking on a piece of plastic from a model car that the, bo the older boys had been uh, putting together. He was turning blue when I found him and almost unconscious because his air had been cut off and I didn't know for how long and I didn't know what to do and someone called 911 and I wondered if they would get there in time to save him. My oldest son Ronnie, one sleeping in the chair back there. <laughs> My oldest son Ronnie, um, his uncle, took him from my arms and by this time he was limp. My son had enough composure to run his middle finger down the baby's throat to dislodge a piece of plastic so it could pass on down into his stomach and didn't uh, cause any complications. Praise the Lord, he was saved and everything was fine. So that was the beginning of many miracles. In 1969, Miracle 4, after James and I was married, we decided to look to, to look for a farm since we both loved horses and we needed um, and we needed a bigger place. And James had joined a wagon train that he went on once a year, and so he ended up buying some more horses. Well, we weren't in church, but God was still working in my life with his goodness and his mercy. Uh, I want to stop here and say that even when you're backslid, God doesn't give up on us. We might give up on him. We might walk away from him. But he goes right along with us. And he's pulling our chestnuts out of the fire as we're making our mistakes. Yes, he wants us to come back and redo our work over again with him. But he does not leave us. The enemy would like us to believe that he leaves us. But he doesn't. Okay. Um, we weren't in church. God was still working in my life, though. Picture this. We had cows that we milked, rabbits, dogs, uh, cats, kids. James had two, and I had five, plus my little grandson. He was about two then and was into everything. Our house was full. Even my brother David came to live with us, and he had to pitch a tent out in the yard and live in it. We had five acres, though, and we had lots of room. But he was a horse lover, too, and so it was like... Um, from the Ozarks, you should have seen us with our broken down truck and the kids and the cats and the dogs and the cows. And Jan was out there milking the cow in the mornings and I was churning the milk to make butter and we, we was having a good time. Except I wasn't there in church serving the Lord. One day I was standing on the balcony of our old farmhouse watching from afar as my husband and some other men were out in the pasture breaking a horse to ride. By now, baby Ronnie was walking and he was into everything. Um, I was looking out there when I seen the baby walking toward the horse and all I could do was yell. As I realized that no one was paying any attention to the baby and there was, their attention was focused on the horse. And just then, the baby decided to sit down right underneath the horse. And here, the men are sandbagging the horse, trying to get the horse used to the weight on his back because people wanted to ride him. And the little baby sitting underneath the horse on the cement, just like, you know, he had good sense. Now, that is not the safest place to sit. It happened so fast as I stood there and watched, knowing something terrible was going to happen. And I couldn't do anything. I was up in the 
balcony. I don't remember calling on Jesus, but I know I did. Because just as a horse picked up his seat to kick, someone, I don't remember who, ran over, grabbed the baby out from underneath the horse's feet. And it all happened so fast that I knew, once again, that Jesus had come to the rescue. God had saved my precious little loved one from being trampled, hurt, even killed. Through the years, I've seen the hand of God bringing life into my family where there should have been death. What, what an awful, awesome God we serve. I know there's probably a lot of people out here in the audience that have miracles too. And I think that we should share them. I mean, because how else is people going to know about the wonderful work that God has done in Kengu? I mean, when you talk to some people about praying, they just look at you like, yeah, okay. When that should be the most important thing, you know? In Hebrews, he says that he will never leave us and forsake us, and that is true. In 1972, this is Miracle 5, my daughter Gloria's second baby was born. It was a boy, and we called him Richard. He was premature by six weeks. My daughter was sick at the time, the whole nine months that she carried him, and so instead of gaining weight, she lost weight. When he was born, he weighed two pounds, six ounces, and then dropped down to two pounds, two ounces. You could hold him in the palm of your hand. Of course, the doctors didn't give us much hope for him even though he had survived and was alive. His little lungs were not fully formed, and therefore he had to be hooked up to a machine to breathe for him. And every time he wet his little diaper, his heart would stop, and the alarms would go on. The ICU nurse then would go into his room and flick the bottom of his feet and start him breathing again. He was born feet first, and he was a sight. Before she delivered him, one of the doctors came and told her that the baby was dead, but she knew better because she had felt him moving. And they were very surprised when he came out and he was alive, but they didn't give us much hope, even though he was alive, that he would survive. But my daughter kept believing that God would pull him through, and God did. The doctor said that even if he did live, he wouldn't be normal because of his oxygen being cut off. They said that he would have disabilities like retardation, deafness, and being blind. Don't you just love it when God shows up after all hope is gone and everything comes out normal? I just love it. I just love it. I just want to run the halls over there at UC Davis when they told me Richard was going to die. And I knew when my pastor went in there and anointed him. He was going to make it. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. He's going to make it. No. Um, Richard, uh, let's see. Okay. Richard gained weight, and when he reached five pounds, he came out of the hospital. He was two months old by then, and he was on high risk. During that time of Richard's birth, my daughter Gloria needed a blood transfusion. And at that time, they didn't check the blood. And she ended up with chronic hepatitis C. That's another story. So... Can you see why I want to get up and praise the Lord? This is just a drop in the bucket of what he has done. Uh, I can remember miracles I haven't put down here, but I said I can't take all that time because he's just a miracle working God. And I want to get up on the highest building in town and just say we serve a miracle working God. In 1972, miracle number seven, by the time James and I, by that time James and I had bought an old two-story house, farmhouse that we called our own, and it was here in the Heights on Maury Avenue, and that's where I live to this day. I have been there 44 years. I didn't want to live there, and I kept coming up with reasons why we should we could move. But every time we moved, we'd have to move back. After I lost my husband to cancer, I thought, surely God will let me move now. And I was on my way to Montana. Wrong. When God has a plan for you, you don't change it. It changes you. Yes. If, if people would just give in in the beginning, they'd save a lot of wear and tear and yeah. shoe leather on themselves 
trying to do their thing in the name of the Lord when God's already got your plan worked out for you. Now keep in mind that I'm still backslidden. I was away from the Lord for nine years, and this day I was up on a ladder fixing a hole in the side of the farmhouse that the woodpeckers had made. And I wasn't in the best of moods. I was complaining to myself about everything. I was using a few choice words when I felt the ladder slip and start to fall. I believe God shoved it over. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> So as I was falling the 10 feet in the air, I knew I was in trouble. So what else could I do except call on Jesus? As I was falling, I was calling, God help me. And crash, I hit the pavement, got gravel on the side of my face, and ended up with three cracked vertebrae. It could have been worse though, I could have broken my neck or my back, but I didn't. God had cushioned my fall. Thank you, Lord. And that is where my journey back to the Lord begins. And he was waiting there with open arms. Just like the prodigal son, I knew that I had gone as far as I could go doing my thing. I had had two close calls, and I did not need a third one to show me that I needed to get back, making things right between me and my Lord. So as I lay there in my bed for three weeks, I made up my mind that if God would give me another chance, I would try and do things right this time. All right, now. Miracle number eight, the year is 1987. Well, by now I'm back in church and I'm teaching Bible study and Sunday school right here at Victory. And life is pretty good. My first great grandson, Buddy, was born that year and he's about two years old and he was out in the yard playing with his papa James, helping him. James was letting him ride in the back of the truck with him as he hooked up his flatbed trailer and put his wagon on it that he used in the wagon trains. Um, James got everything ready and put Buddy off to the side of the truck and told him, stay there. As James pulled out, Buddy ran toward the truck. James didn't see him, and at that time, because he was running between the truck and the trailer, James looked in his rearview mirror and he felt, thought that Buddy had fallen off the trailer. But he hadn't. Uh, the trailer had run over Buddy and flipped him up in the air, but James didn't realize that. He stopped the truck, got out, picked the baby up, and took him into his parents and told him what he thought had happened. But my grandson Ronnie and his wife realized the baby was very seriously hurt and took him to Kaiser. There they stabilized him and as well as they could and transported him to UC Davis because they didn't have a trauma center there at Kaiser. He was quickly evaluated and we were told that he had a bruise on his brain, a punctured lung, and a lacerated spleen, which caused a bleeding ulcer. They had to give him numerous transfusions, but he continued to bleed. So they informed the family that they was going to operate in an attempt to stop the bleeding. They finally took him into surgery and everybody was praying. That's all we could do at that time. We were out to UC Davis and was trying to find a chapel to go in to pray and they didn't have one. And I told someone there, that's the main thing that you should have. You should have some place where people, when they bring injured family members in here, can go and pray because it's a necessity, I think, really. So we had to go find a closet and close the door and pray in the closet. We were told that the sur surgery would take several hours, but it only took 30 minutes. And when the doctors came out, they said that the bleeding ulcer had healed itself. That was due to prayer, right? Um, Within two weeks, he was out of the hospital and doing well, although he was very weak and quiet. He was doing fine. That was just the Lord because um, there was many things that happened. Well, one thing that the Lord had me do, my buddy was in, in his room. He was tied up to machines, and he, he had blood coming out of areas on, on him. And the Lord told me, he spoke to me, and he said, take the anointing cloth, 
cloth that you have in your pocket and stand here by his bedside and rub it over his body. And I thought, I don't have an anointing cloth in my pocket. And I put my hand into my pocket, and I did. Amen. I had gotten it for somebody else and forgot to give it to him. And so I stood there all night long rubbing that all over my grandson. He doesn't remember to this day. I asked him. He's 20 some odd years old right now. And I said, do you remember Grandma standing by you, praying over you and when he was hurt and rubbing you with the anointing cloth? He said, no, Grandma, I don't remember anything about that part of my life. So uh, anyway, um, year 2005, Miracle 9, my youngest son, Mark, had a major stroke on Mother's Day. And the doctor said that it should have killed him. But he was always working out and boxing. And he had built up extra veins in his body because he built good he, in his, uh, here in his neck, OK? And so when the stroke came, the blood that should have went through the arteries that wasn't working anymore went over to the new arteries. All right. And he was fine. I, I got to the hospital and I said, where's my son? I expected to see him near death. He's sitting up in bed with his arms folded. These doctors don't know what they're talking about. There ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm going home. He was a little confused, but he was fine. And the doctor walked in and said, where's the stroke patient? And I said, right there. And he goes, you're a stroke patient? And he said, that's what they tell me. So it was just the Lord. New arteries. And I have the same thing with me. When I go to see my heart doctor, this is all plugged up. I've got new arteries growing in the back of my head. He doesn't know how come I do, but I'm fine other than I get confused every now and then. <laughs> you know, uh, God is such a miracle working God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, year uh, 2008, Miracle 10, I had a heart attack. I just told about that. And there's no, my heart is not damaged at all. I'm just uh, short of air and I have to take medicine all the time. Year 2009, Miracle, Miracle 11. I had mentioned earlier in my testimony that in that year of 1972, my daughter Gloria had had a blood transfusion where she caught chronic hepatitis. Well now, it is 2009 and the damage to her liver is showing up. And at this time she is told that she was in liver failure due to the virus and also had cirrhosis of the liver. Usually you get that from drinking. Yeah. Well, she did that too, but I mean, you know, one or the other messed her liver up. The doctors put her on, rubber, I can't pronounce it, two different medicines, which caused her to be sicker than what she was. And at that time, she was given another blood transfusion and more shots to make her white cells come back up to where they belong. They kept her on treatment for a month, and then took her off again, then put her back on for three months, and then the doctor said that it was making her condition worse and to stop it. The treatment was stopped, and the doctors told her that she had three months to five years to live. Now we're gonna fast forward to June of 2015. They had come out with a new drug that had been in the testing stages when Gloria was taking her other meds. And she was told it was very successful, but she wasn't eligible for it. Despite what the doctors said, though, they got Gloria on, she got on the new drug, but because of, due to a persistent PCA, Gloria was able to get on the new drug for six months, even if she didn't have the $1,000 a day. Mm. She got the medicine. How? I don't know, other than God. She shouldn't have been able to get it. She shouldn't have been eligible for it, okay? And that, um, the same. God provides all, God has always provided all of our needs. He'll provide all of our needs if we just will turn everything over to him and trust him, okay? In January 2016, the tests show now that Gloria no more has the virus, hepatitis. So we need to praise the Lord for that. She came here, last year to sing and uh, Pastor Tim and Pastor Johnny both prayed over her and they each gave her a word and the word turned out to be absolutely correct that God was going to heal her and 
um, can't say she's doing fine, but she's doing much better than she did, but she will always have that damage. She only has 20 per part, 20 part, 20 per part of her, of her uh, liver left. But it's just like having a whole liver to some people. I mean, you know, like I keep telling her, Gloria said, Mom, I don't have much longer liver. I said, oh, yes, you do. You're not checking out until God wants you to check out. So you know, don't get in a hurry. Okay, 2011 Miracle 12. My grandson Richard, Gloria's son, the preemie baby from 1972, is now 39 years old. And he's working at a property management place where the job is very stressful. <laughs> he had a lot of responsibilities on his job and one day at work, he started to have chest pains and had to have his secretary drive him to the hospital. Right after he arrived, while in one of the small examining rooms, he fell off the table and he died. It was documented that he flatlined and was dead for 35 minutes. But the doctor that was working on, on him wouldn't give up and he kept using the paddles on him over and over and over. Way past the legal time to give up. Later on, we looked at Richard's chest and he had the hair burned off and one of his nipples was burned off. While they fought, well, they finally got a pulse and they brought him back, but the doctors came and found me and told me that he was barely alive and they didn't hold out much hope for him. I told him that I believed in prayer and he was going to make it. Two days later, he woke up from his coma and he knew everybody in the hospital room. The doctors were very surprised. They said that if he did survive, he would be like a vegetable because of lack of oxygen. He couldn't talk because of all the tubes plus being incubated to him. So, plus being incubated to help him breathe. But he could communicate with his eyes and he could write notes. His first year was pretty bad. His kidneys were, weren't working properly and they had to, and he had to, they had to put a catheter on him, which he wore for a year. In fact, he had to have two. <laughs> Uh, one in his bladder and the other one you can just imagine where. He had to go to dialysis regularly for the first year and after that he had to have surgery to remove the catheters because they had built up scar tissue and it was really, really bad. No, we had talked to Richard's doctor previously and asked him why he kept using the paddles on him so long and he couldn't really answer our question. All he could say was he just had to keep doing it. Wow. So it was just gone. Yes. Yes. God has the right people at the right time yes, doing what God wants them to do. Yes. And sometimes they don't even understand it. I myself have said things and done things that I thought, where did that come from? Right. It's just the Lord. He will put the words in your mouth. He'll tell you when to stop. He'll tell you when to go. Yeah. Okay, Miracle 13, year 2017. This is about my great-grandson that just got in a car wreck over here on the freeway. The day started off like any other day when my phone rang with bad news. My great-grandson, Damien Hobbs, was involved in a serious accident on Highway 80. The car that he was riding in was hit in a chain reaction. He was in the last car in a seven-pile car seven pile car, uh, whatever. He was not wearing a seat belt and he was thrown out of the car. The driver of the car had his seat belt on and only received a broken shoulder. The car that Damien was in rolled several times. He was, he's a very small framed boy and he doesn't look like he could weigh 100 pounds soaking wet. He was thrown several feet in the air striking the cement retainer wall that runs along the side of the freeway. By the time the ambulance got there, he was in critical condition. His small body was broken in many pieces. The doctors at UCD worked to put him back together, feeling that it was of no use since they brought him in. He thought they were going and he, they looked at him, they thought he was going to die from all of his injuries. He had broken bones in his back, broken ribs, a broken collarbone, a fractured skull, and his face, and his face was Hurt. His brain was so swollen that the doctors had to remove the top part of his skull 
so that his brain could finish swelling. You should have seen him. He looked like he had a, he had a hat on to keep his brain intact because the top of his skull was gone, and he looked like he had a football helmet on. I don't know what kind of uh, helmet it was they put on. I guess it's made especially for people that have head injuries. But um, And he was fighting the doctors all the way. They had to tie him down and put a tent over his bed, and he wasn't going to get out of there and go home, and he couldn't. He would have died. And uh, he just was, wasn't acting good at all. No. Um, okay. His brain was swollen, and they had to take the top part off. And they were thinking that they could make him, they was thinking they was going to have to make him titanium eye sockets because they even thought he was going to be blind because it injured, it injured all up on top of his forehead and everything. When his grandfather, my, my son Ronnie, got the news, he asked me, Mom, would you take me to see him? Now, I don't drive on the freeway. I don't really drive at all. I keep my license up. I didn't want to, but the Lord put his thumb in my back and I had to renew it. But I go here and I go to the store. You very seldom ever see me out on the street. So, And when Ronnie said, Mom, would you take me to the hospital? I'm going, oh, Lord, how am I going to get to UC Davis? You know? <coughs> I reminded him I couldn't take the freeway and we would have to go down 12th Street. And you know, you go down 12th Street, then you go over to Alhambra, and then you go down Stockton Boulevard, and nothing, nothing. So we went all the way through town, and when we finally got there to the hospital, everybody was there waiting to hear how Damien was. I couldn't go in and see him and anoint him with oil, so I just prayed right there in the parking lot of the hospital. I was there trying to comfort my family, and I heard from my grandson, but I had a peace about me that it can only come from knowing Jesus and know that he was in good hands. Okay. All of the doctors, all, and as all the doctors worked on him, not knowing he was going to make it, the Lord had already told me he would live and not die, but that it would be a long road back. Well, Damien is out of the hospital now, and he's on his way to Mindy, oh. all because we serve an awesome God. Yeah. We never This is the last miracle. It's not the last one that's been in my family, but it's the last one I'm going to tell you about. Uh, they had that, you know when they had a big fire up here in Orville? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I have a son that lives up there. I'll finish this with, in July, news broke out that there was a large fire in the foothills of Orville. My middle son has a home up there at, off of Black Mark Road. And right where the fire was, the fire was right behind him. As the fire grew closer, people in the path of the fire was evacuated, leaving everything behind. Even in some cases, their medications they had to leave behind. My son has had a stroke, and he's had several heart attacks, and he has Crohn's disease and some other things that's wrong with him. And he needed his meds, but he had to leave them behind and just go out, get his little son, put it in the truck, and leave. As the fire got closer and closer, all we could do was pray. We prayed for everyone on that hill. The fire did not touch some, and their things were set, were not lost, but then, but then some of them lost everything. Why, I can't say. But my son's home was saved and not touched at all, while his two friends, one on either side of him, lost everything. Go right. figure, prayer works. There are so many miracles at work in our lives today, but sometimes we don't stop and see God's hand at work. Amen. So, anyway, I just wanted to share this, not for me, but for the Lord. I get got upset. I got so upset when Richard was in the hospital, and they didn't put it on in the newspaper. I, I something like that. I think should be on the front page. Amen. Amen. God's moving. He's not dead. Look what yes. he's doing. Yes. From the dead. Yes, yes. And then when my son and my grandson Damien walked out of the hospital when they thought he was not going to survive, he should have been in there. God should be getting more glory than what he's getting. And that's why I felt that I needed to 
put down all the miracles that he's done just in my family. And I know there's a lot of people out there that has way more miracles than I do. Mm -hmm. Here? Yeah, I'd like you to talk to me when you get You want to talk to me? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay, Pastor, I'm going to turn this over to you. Wow. Wow. Pastor Johnny just told me the word's already been given today. Amen. So he's not going to preach Amen. today. Well, he's going to save his message for, for another time. Amen. 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 Uh, but praise God. I want, I, want to, I want to tell you something. I cannot emphasize how the world does not like to give God the glory for anything. Yes. You know? And when when Mary Lou asked me to go pray for Richard, she was doing that out of obedience because uh, her son, Richard, did not like me at all. Not at all. He walked out of here one day just with his kids because I was disciplining my little kids from the platform. And uh, then we had another scrape when his stepfather passed away and he thought I was a liar and we, he didn't like me at all. At all. And so for me to go to the hospital, for her to even ask me to go because the Lord asked her to, told her to do it, was a big step of faith because, you know, nobody wants someone that doesn't like them but not to pray for her, you know? And, uh, and when I went in that hospital room to pray for her because Mary Lou asked me to, and I knew if she asked me to, she heard from God. And when I walked in there to pray for him, the nurse came into the room and she told me, now, she said, well, you go ahead and pray for him if you want to. But he's already brain dead. We're just waiting for his family to accept it before we turn off the machines. So, we serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. Not, it had nothing to do with me praying for him. or what. It had to do with obedience to the word of God. And that God performs his will. Amen? And it was a little mama that prayed and listened to God and was obedient to what God told, instructed her to do. Amen? So God has been working in Mary Lou's life, and I know yeah. God is working in my life. I have a son who broke his neck. I was told that he was not going to live, and they, that uh, I should get on the next plane home. They couldn't guarantee they could keep him alive until I got home. And you all know him, but Timmy. He's, he's, he's usually here. Today he's sick. But uh, God is an awesome God. When we walked in, when, when we walked in to Kaiser for his six-week follow-up after he had the broken neck, we walked in and they had a different person, a different doctor on the schedule than he had been scheduled to see. We didn't know why. They switched him up. And so we walked in to see the doctor that was a different name than what we had scheduled. And it was the head of neck and surgery for Kaiser. He said, I've been the head of this department for 30 years. I've never seen a CAT scan with a set of x-rays and an MRI like yours to myself. He said, if you don't believe in God, you should. Because you're a miracle that you're, not only are you alive, but that you're walking upright. I've never seen somebody fall from that height and not be totally paralyzed if not killed. We serve an awesome God. He's an awesome God. And he does awesome things every day. Amen. And let's stand together. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to the Spaghetti Factory if anybody wants to go there. The one on Watt Avenue, right? Oh, Sunrise. So we're going to the Spaghetti Factory on Sunrise. Uh, and uh, Sunrise and Rosewood, Sunrise Avenue. So if you want to join us, that's where we're going for lunch today. It's always open to everybody. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to have Pastor Fonda come close us in prayer today. We do thank you so very much, Father, because you do great things. You do miracles so great. Father, if you never gave anything else for us, you saved us. Well, you died for us and you, you've loved us and the foundation of the world was formed. And you are a great God. You are a loving Father and a kind Father. 
and we just praise and thank you. We can't thank you enough. We thank you for everything that's come forth this day in this service. We thank you, Lord, that everybody here, oh God, that needed a touch from you received from you today. We thank you, oh God, that when we leave this place, you don't leave us, that you go out with us. We thank you, Lord, because you care. And we thank you, Father, for the rest of the week and the rest of the plans you have for us. You said in Jeremiah, you know the plans you have for us, plans for good and not for evil, for our hope in the future. And we thank you for all of your promises. And we ask you to go with each one this day as you dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. And we are. Go with God today. Be blessed throughout your week.